Interrogating serial killers required that I dive into the abyss of their minds. And locked into their eyes, time stood still in the abyss. Yet at the back of my mind, I was aware of the detectives patiently and sometimes impatiently waiting. For the clock is ticking and there was only a window of opportunity to get a confession. Quite often, the interrogation was the last time that I saw most of the serial killers, unless, of course, I testified in their trials. And sometimes I was requested to tend to one or two of them in prison. Some of them wrote me letters to which I never responded, but I never really got the chance to sit down and just talk to them. In 2001, I was the external examiner of Bryn Hotchkiss's master's thesis, and it was titled, A Multivariate Model of the Offense Behavior of South African Serial Killers. As commander of South African Police's Investigative Psychology Unit, I needed someone to conduct research and build up an archive of our serial killers, and Bryn volunteered. I resigned from the South African Police, but Bryn continued by interviewing South African serial killers in prison, and the bulk of his work later formed the basis for his doctorate's degree. Now, Dr. Bryn Hutchkins relocated to England, and for 15 years, he worked for the UK police as a crime analyst and a strategic intelligence manager. Bryn Hotchkiss is now the head of the transformation management at the UK NHS. For years, the tapes of the interviews of the serial killers were gathering dust, until he was contacted by the podcast presenter of True Crime Essay, the author Nicole Engelbrecht. And through their cooperation, the book Killer Stories, Conversations with Serial Murderers was born and published by Jonathan Bull this year in 2024. As a research psychologist, Bryn used the methodology of narrative psychology to delve into the minds of the serial killers. Bryn had the courage to enter the abyss, but unlike me, he dwelled there much longer as he was not pressed for time. And for the first time in 30 years, through Bryn's remarkable work and book and Nicole's, I get to revisit the abyss. But this time, my former student has become my colleague and a valued companion. According to the ethical research principles, Bryn allocated pseudonyms to each of the killers that are mentioned in the book. Nicole was responsible for writing down the factual history of the crimes that these men committed. But Bryn opened Pandora's box, giving the re reader more insight into the minds, the motives and the memories of these men in their own words. Bryn identifies and allocates a narrative theme like the fog, isolation, revenge, disintegration and the other to each of his subjects. Significantly, he touches upon the topic that serial killers are not monsters. That sitting at a table across them, one is struck with their humanity and that they differ so much from the media persona projected onto, onto them. Now, I've com commented on the synthetic sensationalism of the media and I'm in total agreement with Bryn on this. Instead of a two-dimensional photograph on a newspaper front cover, Bryn introduces them to the readers as humans in all their dimensions. He describes the ominous appearance and the contrasting quiet demeanor of one of these killers and then unexpectedly he notices the killer's hands. They were soft hands and then he had to remind himself of the crime scene photographs and what this killer and those hands had actually done. Now this particular killer is often depicted by the press as a monster and I recognized him immediately and I'm sure that most of our readers would also. But respecting Bryn's ethics, I will refer to him by his pseudonym as Michael. In this man's narrative, Bryn identifies the characters of the avenging monster, the savior monster and the wounded child and the disintegration that exists between these characters. As the wounded child, the killer, in his own words, described when he was raped as a child, and he says, I was in a single room and I cried out. I screamed, God help me, but nothing came. God didn't help me. Every time I see a child raped, I have that. I have pain because I know what it feels like to go through it. 
In the character of the avenging monster, he elaborates how he took revenge on his wife's infidelity and prostitution by killing prostitutes. He also talked about what I have often called the omnipotent power that serial killers feel when they kill. And here he says, I want to show God that I am God. And I want to show God you weren't there when I needed you. So I, I am God. I will preside over life and death. When doing these murders, I transformed. I became bigger. The character of the savior monster is more complex. Michael's narrative is that he murdered the children to save them from living a life as he had as a, a sexually abused child. And he says, I always said you mustn't abuse a child because then I will take the child. Then I will hear. I want God to hear how that child screams and they cry out. They cry out for God like I did when I was raped. And then in the process of raping them, I murder them. I kill them. About his killing his own daughter, he says he believed that she was sexually molested by her stepfather, despite her denying this. He says, many people wonder why I took my daughter away. They don't know. It was because she was raped. I didn't want her to grow up like I grew up. Maybe one day she would grow up to become a murderess because her father is a serial murderer. Now, Michael admitted to Bryn that he confessed because he decided to work with the police to protect the children. What struck me about the book, and something that Bryn also referred to in a later podcast with Nicole, is that the narratives of these serial killers do not match the psychological explanation that forensic psychologists provide for the motivation of these killers. My own explanation on the origin of serial killers is based upon Freud's theory particularly the psychosexual developmental phases, and Menelie Klein's work on the subconscious childhood sexual fantasies. Now one can understand that the serial killers themselves are not psychologists, and they would obviously not have the background to analyze themselves. And secondly, these motivations are embedded in the subconscious, therefore obviously they are not aware of them. Most people are not aware of their own shadow lurking in their subconscious. No one would easily admit to believing Melanie Klein's theory of a child's pre-verbal fantasy of scooping out the contents of the mother's breast, unless they see evidence on a crime scene of a killer having cut the breast of a victim and eating her nipples because he was not breastfed. And I have witnessed this on the particular, this particular serial killer's crime scene, so Melanie Klein's theory to me makes a lot of sense. One can simply not expect a serial killer to have this kind of psychoanalytical training or insight. Most of them blame others for making them kill. So in their narratives, they find other, more understandable explanations for their crimes, such as he killed and he raped the children to punish their parents for abusing their children, to show God that he, the killer, was omnipotent, and to save the children from living a life as a victim of rape, he would rather send them to a place of peace. This justification of blaming is blaming and avoiding accountability. Bryn refers to this as a condemnation script. The belief in being a helpless victim justify each set of crimes. I do not think the serial killers ask themselves philosophical or psychological questions about why they kill, when they kill. But years of incarceration may prompt them to start wondering. And then, as Bryn rightly points out, they need to spin their narratives and bits of their story just doesn't make sense. It's just the way I am, most of them said. Bryn asks a tantalizing question. So how can you, the reader, avoid falling victim to your own version of a killer story? How can your secret selves become your ally rather than your enemy? And gratefully, he proceeds by providing guidance in changing your own narrative. The secret selves with which you populate your inner narratives can trap you or set you free. Whichever of these you choose to follow is up to you. Both Bryn and Nicole were quite candid about their own redemption narratives and Bryn writes, 
The more I showed people my secret self, the more I understood that being undermined by our inner stories is not the sole prerogative of serial killers. It happens to all of us. If it could happen to somebody like me, growing up, surrounded by love and support, privileged in almost every sense of the word, then no one is safe. That is why I wrote this book. Bryn refers to generativity, a psychological shorthand term for when a person is concerned about guiding the next generation. Kudos to you and Nicole for writing the book, Bryn. One candle can light up the dark, but a candle can burn out. If we band our generativity together, we build a lighthouse that shines into that abyss. Thank you for shining your light. Please get your copy of Killer Stories, Conversations with South African Serial Killers by Bryn Hodgkiss and Nicole Engelbrecht. If you like these videos, please give us your thumbs up and subscribe. And if you'd like to join our Patreon community, then please click on our QR code. Thank you.